You say, what about the Chinese? You understand, we had trade routes, the Turks traded with China when people in Italy didn't think there was anything past Israel. You know, until Marco Polo goes and says, oh, by the way, I've discovered China. It's been here this whole time. I refound it. The Turkish had been trading nonstop for that thousand intervening years. There were churches in certain regions in China that had been there over a thousand years when missionaries started going back in. So do the Chinese. Chinese may very well. You know? These all died in faith, verse 13, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off and were persuaded and embraced them and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. When God makes a promise, you have to understand the greater truth that underlies it. Otherwise, you will get things apart. You will lose hope. They understood there was a much huge, much huger picture. Much huger is even a phrase. There was a much huger picture of what was going on here than just a little piece of real estate. This is why it's unfortunate that religious people in America get hung up on this Israel garbage because even Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob didn't get hung up on the land promise. They were looking for the eternal promise that was the bigger picture that underlaid it. Verse 14, For they that say such things declare plainly that they seek a country, and truly if they had been mindful of that from which they came out of, they might have had an opportunity to have gone back to it. But now they desire a better country, that is the heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God. Because they get the big picture, God is happy to say, I'm their God. Now, isn't that a fascinating thing for God to say, I'm proud to be called your God. Who would think that God would be like, Yo, you angels, you see that one? I'm his God. I'm her God. God is not ashamed to be called their God. Why? Because they get the bigger picture. <coughs> but now they desire a better country, He's prepared, for He has prepared for them a city. Verse 17, By faith Abraham, when he was tried, offered up Isaac. And he that had received the promises offered up his only begotten son. He was the only one that counted from a legal standpoint. Once the wife had a firstborn, that became the only begotten from a legal standpoint, and the child of the slave had no legal any claim. Okay? Yet God took care of Ishmael and his descendants, because God said of Ishmael's descendants, what? They should be twelve princes also. Of whom it was said, verse 18, that in Isaac shall thy seed be called, According that God was able to raise him up even from the dead, from whence also he received him in a figure. How stone cold was Abraham's faith after 38 years? 25 years he waits for a son. 13 years now the son is at that age. And God says go offer him as a burnt offering. And Abraham that night sits down, contemplates it, says, well... God said that this is the one in whom my seed is going to be called. Isaac doesn't have any children. He doesn't even have a wife. I don't even think he's got a girlfriend. But if I kill him and offer him as a burnt offering, then the only thing that's going to be left is bones and ashes. But with everything else God has ever done in my life, I know that God can reassemble the ashes and the bones and bring him back from the dead. And we go back and we read the account of Genesis and it says, And the next morning he got up with Isaac and his men and they set out from Mount Moriah. When someone says, I need to think on it a few days before I decide if I'm going to be obedient to God. You know, Desi saw it. You know, uh, Linda has seen it. When we come to that stage in the study, where I know you know what baptism means, I know you know who Christ is, and I know you've got sin, it will get real uncomfortable. Real uncomfortable. Why? 
because now eternity is on the line. And if you get up from that table and you walk away and you say no, the odds of you ever coming back to that point of decision again and saying yes go down about 99%. I'm not a huge fan of follow-up studies on baptism. Had Abraham said, I'll think about it for three or four days, he probably would not have offered up Isaac. He thought about it that night. He understood what was required of him by God. He understood God's path faithfulness. And he got up the next morning and he made that step. He didn't delay on it for weeks. Once he knew what he had to do and once he understood and he was clear in his brain, he did it right then. And since baptism is a death, and we receive our lives back in a figure, we're redoing what Abraham did with Isaac in a way. By faith, Isaac blessed Jacob and Esau concerning things to come. By faith, Jacob, when he was dying, blessed both the sons of Joseph and worshipped, leaning upon the top of his staff. By faith, Joseph, when he died, made mention of the departing of the children of Israel and gave commandment concerning his bones. He took his father's bones back and buried them. Joseph said, don't leave my bones here. Now here's a funny thing. What happened to the bones of his 11 brothers? Did they get buried in Egypt? Because it says that Joseph's bones came up. But I don't know about his brethren. But Joseph left a command that because Joseph had been accepted at that level of royalty, when they left, his bones went in Egyptian fashion. But as he's dying, he says, you carry my bones back home. Where was home? Home was where all they'd ever done was have tents. By faith, Moses, when he was born, was hid three months of his parents because they saw he was a proper child and they were not afraid of the king's command, meaning they didn't kill their son so that they could live at peace with the king. This is an argument about the value of the life of a child. The issue is now finally being raised about after birth abortion. After the child is born, if the mother decides there's something about it she doesn't like, to go on ahead and kill it if it's within a certain time window. That is the next step that they're trying to start arguing for. Yes. Yeah. Uh, this abortion thing has been around for millennia. Okay? By faith, Moses, when he was come to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. Don't ever lie to someone and say sin's not pleasurable. God says sin is pleasurable. But what? You only get to enjoy it for a season. Drunkenness and fornication are a blast for a season. <coughs> But what? You will die. You know? And some people found out what? Drunkenness and fornication aren't as much fun as they thought. Car wreck, disease, death, crippling. You know? But sin is pleasurable, but it's only for a season. Here's the difference, though. He esteemed, he held in higher value the reproach of Christ as greater riches than the treasures in Egypt, for he had respect under the recompense of the reward. He knew the value of what he had in his own people and what God was doing in his own people racially, that that was worth more to him than being Pharaoh of Egypt. Because his son of Pharaoh's daughter he could have taken that over and he could have been the next Pharaoh. By faith he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. Through faith he kept the Passover. This is talking about uh, when he went into the desert. Uh, 
Through faith he kept the Passover and the sprinkling of blood, lest he that destroyed the firstborn should touch them. Again, there's no precedent for this Passover event. Yet he believes when God says, do it. Who was saved? Those who did it. Who wasn't saved? Those who didn't. If you applied the blood to your doorpost the day after the destroyer had passed through, did they get to come back to life? A plus B equals C. Mix up the order. Back then it was spiritual, it was physical and spiritual death. With us, it's spiritual death. Uh, but most people, once they get the order mixed up, you know how hard it is to ever get them unmixed? It's, uh, it's almost as catastrophic. It's possible. It's just, it takes a lot of work. And you might as well do the work since you're here and you got time. And they're going to hell if you don't, so you might as well put in the work in the place. Gives you something to do. Either that or watch television. The Lord will judge you by your problems. Okay. Say, boy, well, way to make us feel guilty about not doing evangelism where we could. That's all right. Every time I say something to you like that, the Lord slaps me upside my head for more than I should be doing. By faith, they passed through the Red Sea, as by dry land, which the Egyptians attempting to do were drowned. I think you need to pause on that miracle. You have this huge body of water. It opens up. The ground's dry. You go down in, and you're totally covered by water. You've got a cloud over the top of you. And on the sides, you've got walls of water. You're walking in the bottom of an ocean. But you can see eels and sea bass and all that in the walls of water as you're walking past. You had an army behind you. You can't technically see the other side to which you were going because it's too far. Yet you still go down in. That's huge. That's huge. Again, this is a type of baptism. 1 Corinthians 10. They were all baptized in the cloud into Moses. This is how they were baptized into Moses through the Red Sea. You and I can't see what's on the other side of our baptism. We can't see it. We see it by faith, but we don't see see it. We go down in, though, believing that that's the way to life. By faith, the walls of Jericho fell down. And, and the Egyptians, they, they thought that they could pass through. And who remembers what happened? God made the wheels of the chariots come off when they got in the middle of the ocean so that they had nowhere to go. They couldn't get back out in time. And then he folded the ocean back on top of them. Two people attempting to do the same thing. One by faith, one not. Yeah. Yeah. Some year, two years ago, you know, like the history channel or something, they were contemplating where this crossing was. And, and, this, and the time of the year and everything so they could go across and you know, everything. Yeah. Miracle was they lived in a spot. God drowned in all the yeah. enemy. Yeah, that's all the one you're talking about. That one little section in the whole sea of reeds. Yeah. And it's like, you know, and that it takes more faith to believe the explanation. I mean, like Moses purposely was like, well, if we do this lamb killing thing on this day, then you'll have this. How do you coordinate a response of three million people? like that after the killing of the lamb. How do you coordinate killing all of the firstborn of everything in the entire land except for your one region of the country? But it stops at the borders of the empire. How do you coordinate all that just so? And then get three million people motivated that wished for your death, starting with plague number one, to now follow you into the middle of nowhere with the most powerful army in the world chasing them down with the goal of killing them, hoping that they'll all cross perfectly 
on this little narrow path that isn't even as wide as this room. Yeah, I think I'll go for the Red Sea split thing. It just makes better sense. Oh, yeah. Everything else. Yeah, the movie makes it seem like it was over that quick. Man, it takes hours to move that many people, that much livestock, and that many possessions. Uh, oh, yeah. Cecil B. DeMille did a great job. He was a wise man. He knew he'd become a millionaire, a nickel at a time, with that movie. Yeah. Uh, that was what he said one time. He said, I'll become a millionaire with this a nickel at a time. Mm -hmm. and he did. Uh, but don't ever confuse Cecil DeMille with what the scripture says. There's a few things out of kilter there. Mm -hmm. uh, but an excellent movie. Tremendous movie. Charlton Heston, The Voice of Moses. Uh, By faith, the walls of Jericho fell down after they were compassed about seven days. This is grace by faith. Marching in a circle for seven days does not cause the walls of a city to fall down. I don't care how many people say that if they stomped their feet really hard, it would have had X amount of seismic disturbance, and that would have disrupted and corrupted the foundations of the city walls. And on day seven, the blowing of the trumpets would have sent out uh, waves, sound waves, that would have caused the final collapse of the walls. And again, I'll ask the same question I asked earlier that my wife gave me a look for. Really? Are you people that stupid? The walls fell in. Walls normally would fall out in that kind of scenario. They fell in, which meant the people inside the city were trapped and they couldn't get up and out. That means that the children of Israel were able to run up the walls like a ramp and descend on them and slaughter the whole town. What work did they do? None. They did this ridiculous once a day for six day march. And then on day seven, seven times with the trumpet blast, and all of a sudden the walls come down. Except one place. Yeah. Except that one. Yeah, except Rahab, yeah. Yeah. And uh, and so then we come down and we've got uh, you know, we've got Rahab. And, and we're out of time, and I'll ask the same question that the uh, writer of Hebrews does. And what more shall I say? For the time would fail me to speak of Gideon and of Barak and of Samson and of Jephthah. Samson be in heaven? Yes. Jephthah? Yes. Of David also and Samuel and of the prophets. Notice who's missing. Who through faith subdued kingdoms, worked righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions. Who do you think that's talking about? Daniel. That's why I say this, this 11th chapter takes in the entire Old Testament. They quenched the violence of fire. Who do you think that was talking about? Hananiah, Azariah, and Mishael. You know them popularly as Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Escaped the edge of the sword. Out of weakness they were made strong. They waxed valiant in fight. Turned to flight the armies of the aliens. <coughs> as in alien peoples, not space invaders. For people that go to the Bible to find space invaders. Do what, sister? It would be very interesting. <laughs> Get back to Mars, you! Yes. Uh, women received their dead raised to life again. Elijah and Elisha events here. Um, other, now, now, this is all victory stuff that comes from faith. Now, here's some of the other stuff that comes from faith. And others were tortured, not accepting deliverance. It's okay if you say, you know, I've got a chance to die for God and to die faithful. Let me die. Some in the church, no, you shouldn't do that. It's okay to die. Really, it's okay. We all got to go through it at some point. If you can die for Christ in that moment, man, take your hit and get out. Get out and go underneath the throne. And then when you get to the bottom of the throne, you know what your prayer gets to be? How long, O oh Lord, till you avenge our blood? You know? Pretty sweet deal. That they might obtain a better resurrection. 
Others had trial of cruel mockings and scourging, yea, moreover of bonds and imprisonment. They were stoned, meaning stoned with stones. In Colorado, they're going to have to explain that, and Washington State now. They were stoned with stones. Some were cut in two, sawn asunder. Some were tempted. I think that probably refers back to Joseph. Some were slain with the sword. They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, and tormented. The victory of faith also comes with death, and horrible death, and tor terrible death, sometimes. Of whom the world was not worthy. Every martyr of God is a testimony against the world, and the world is not worthy for one drop of one martyr to touch it. The world is not worthy of these people. Who were they? Just average folks like you and I. Who, when the moment of truth came, they stood up and they did what was right. So how do you know that? Because we don't have their names. We're just told what they went through. We got the name list already. They wandered in deserts and mountains and dens and in caves of the earth. And all these, having obtained a good report through faith, received not the promise. They still didn't get it. Why? God having provided some better thing for us, the church, that without us, they should not be made perfect. Do you realize Abraham's perfection depends on us in the church. Until he does what he's going to do with the church, he will not finish what he started in Abraham and finish his promise to Abraham. When someone says, the church belongs to Jesus, but Israel belongs to the Father, that is utterly ridiculous. Without the church, all of the history of the nation of Israel can never be completed. We are the crowning act of God's entire salvation history. How important is faith? All of eternity rests on it. And all of our eternity rests on it. That's the class. <clears throat> Let's sing Jesus Love Me one verse with the words and the tune we normally know. And, uh, and then uh, Brother Rob, if you'll dismiss us in prayer. Can you little ones sing Jesus Love Me with us? All right. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Little ones to Him belong, they are weak, but He is strong. Yes, Jesus loves me, yes, Jesus loves me.